On a planet called Origin, there are many groups of people from all sorts of diverse backgrounds. There are at least 14 separate species that are considered sapient under draconia law. Today I'm going to talk about humanoids, and the Orient in general. This video is just part one, and soon I want to talk more about how the people of the region live in a more speculative anthropology type of video. While humanoids superficially sort of resemble primates, DNA studies have shown that they evolve from basal filiform carnivorans. They don't have any close living relatives as they diverged from other living filiforms about 40 million years ago. However, the fossil record can help us see into the strangely linear past of humanoid evolution. 40 million years ago, in the lush jungles of the equatorial orient lived a little critter that was uniquely good at climbing trees. It also had similar features on its skull that hint at large ears, possibly hairless like modern humanoids and good at releasing heat. They had weird little hands that allowed them to grasp branches, like living filiforms of similar sizes, so it was probably nocturnal and may have had slit-like pupils. It was named Eo Archontis, Eo meaning early, and Archontis being ruler, back when humanoids were thought to be primates within the clade Eo Archonta, which means true ruler. It was thought to be related to lorises, which are the most basal living primates. However, due to certain features in the skull looking more like humanoids and other filiforms, it was later decided to be more closely related to them. Since the discovery of tree shrews being basal Euarchontans, the name Euarchonta seems pretty stupid at this point. Anyway, humans and anything more closely related to Euarchontus than other filiforms is considered a true primate in the clade Eu primates. Because of rules regarding scientific names, primates can't be changed to pseudoprimates, so I'll continue to refer to false primates as just primates to avoid confusion. True primates, however, are nested in the order Carnivora. Only a few fossils of true primates have been found, since jungles have acidic soil that makes fossilization less likely. This is one of the latest surviving non-hominid eu primates, called Parahominus or Beside Man. It lived 20 million years ago and seemed to have even better tree climbing skills than really anything alive today. Its brain was significantly larger than the brain of Eo Archontis, though it wasn't at all the direct ancestor of humans as hominids had already evolved at this point. Parahominus had fingernails to better grasp trees, but eventually were outcompeted by monkeys, maybe because they were nocturnal and much smaller than something like a sphinx monkey or a bear monkey, which feasibly could have eaten them. Lastly, there's the recently discovered Homo pithecus, which lived 10 million years ago. It was likely closely related to the ancestor of modern humanoids, and may even have had the humanoid element. I haven't talked about magical elements in this video yet, my magic video really gets into it, but I'll get into the humanoid element specifically later in this video. To continue describing Homo pithecus, it seems like it didn't hang out in trees much anymore and was adapted to walking upright on the ground. It hadn't lost the long arms yet, but almost certainly used them for tools and stuff. Its brain case wasn't as big as humans, but suggests intelligence greater than most other animals. Its feet were clearly on the way to human feet, which are really weird looking. They're adapted to running or walking long distances on two legs, but are also plantigrade, meaning the entire foot is on the ground as opposed to just the toes. The only similar animal is new shoes, which are still adapted to running quadrupedally and are generally slow and lumbering on two legs. Every other bipedal animal, at least that I can currently think of, is the digitigrade, meaning toes on the ground. Bears don't count their quadrupeds. Anyway, the weirdest thing about human feet is probably the pronounced arch and super forward toes. It's to get a grip on the ground to go forward fast. Humans are really weird, and it's not just the feet. At first you might think they're just noodly new shoes or pseudogens with the coolness factor dropped to zero, but they're incredibly fascinating on their own. First, I want to talk about sexual dimorphism, and I'm totally going to simplify it. So evolution does what works. Sexual reproduction works well to keep a species going compared to asexual, because two sexes help to keep genes diverse and avoid the issue of one thing taking out the entire species, which is more likely if everyone has exactly the same DNA. One gamete being larger helps because if they're both small, they'd have trouble surviving, while if they're both large, they'd have trouble moving around to find each other. That's how we ended up with eggs and sperm. For a lot of species, it makes sense for females to be larger than males, because bigger body means more eggs. Sperm are easy enough to make that males can just splooge all over the eggs and call it a day. When you get to amniotes though, another factor comes into play. Eggs are really costly, like way more costly than sperm. It takes a lot of energy to grow babies, and the sperm giver is doing very little of that. So it makes sense for the females to be the choosier, and I say that with quotations, sex. You get what I mean. When males fight to get a female, it helps for a male to be large. 
Remember that evolution just does what works. So even if they don't fight anymore, it's not like the male immediately gets smaller, just because the pressure to be that way is gone. Males often have secondary sex characteristics like bright colors or a mane, or other display features whether or not they fight, which is to impress the female in hopes she'll choose him. Back to humans, the average male is significantly larger than the average female, pointing to fighting in their ancestry even if they don't necessarily do that now. It might also just be one of those display characteristics, along with facial hair and broad shoulders. The twist is that females also have secondary sex characteristics, breasts and wide hips, which implies that males might be choosy too. The most convincing theory I've heard for this is that they each have their own reasons to be choosy in different contexts. The one doing the birthing has reason to be choosy, like we said before. Not only is being pregnant and growing a baby inside you a ton of work, you also have to raise that baby for more than a decade, possibly by yourself. If you know you gotta do that, you're gonna be really choosy, ideally getting a partner who will stay with you forever and help raise that baby with you. That's where we get to the males being choosy. If they want, they can make countless babies by splooging into a different person each day. But because the ideal splooger for most people getting splooged in is a splooger that will stick around, the splooger kinda has to be choosy too. They're foregoing countless opportunities to spread their genes to invest in one, up to like 10 depending on how insane they are. Also to like have happy family or something, I don't know, to each their own. That also explains the secondary sex characteristics of Pseudogen and Nushu's women, even if it's to a lesser degree. The fun part is that everything I've just said is kind of a generalization. Again, evolution just does what works, and sometimes there's weird outliers. It's very rare for a rule in biology to not have exceptions, and I'm unfortunate enough to be one of those exceptions. Life is what you make it, and there's no real reason to focus it around making babies. You don't even have to focus it around splugin and whatnot. You can literally do whatever you want. Like throwing. Something humans are really, really good at is throwing. Although the average Nushus has up to three times the muscle mass of the average human, the average human can throw quite a bit farther. It has to do with shoulder anatomy. The average human can throw a ball the size of their fist about 40 meters, and they're really good at throwing spears too. Like I talked about before, it's probably how they started getting the upper hand over everything else. They also have minimal hair to make cooling down in water easier, which could explain their big floppy ears as well. This makes them a bit dependent on bodies of water, since they can't sweat like many Tanyan, but still gives them an advantage over most other animals. Finally, to talk about the humanoid magic element, I want to bring up the concept of the indomitable human spirit. No life is truly immortal, and certainly nothing dead can come back. People of the old world wrongly believed that humanoids were an exception when the Orient was discovered, but the truth isn't so far away. Although their magic is usually subpar, their power multiplies exponentially when under significant stress. This can happen for anybody, but this factor is so significant for humanoids that it was dubbed the indomitable human spirit. This is the pillar that most humanoid magic studies are built upon, or at least the more important of two pillars. The second pillar is categorized by something called spirit fusion. In short, it's an ability that certain groups of humans have that allows them to fuse their being with other organisms. Only some can do it in such a way that is argued to be a separate subspecies of human called Homo sapiens esperi. Named after Esperique, one of two countries, the other being Taurus, where this is especially common. It's got religious connotations for some people as they consider God or the Allfather as one with nature, and to become one with him means combining yourself with the natural. However, this ability isn't without its limits and dangers. First, the more intelligent an organism is, the harder it is to fuse with it. This makes it impossible to fuse with another person, if they're not willing. It's also difficult to fuse with something physically powerful, like a dragon, without getting some unwanted characteristics of them. Similar things happen with arthropods, though no one's completely sure why. You can get undesired traits from anything though, an example being the story of Jose Toronja. He was able to fuse with an Auroch bull at the young age of 10. He was ashamed of his small build and wanted to be big and bulky like a bull. He got his wish, but not without its side effects. He cured to adult size in just a year, but because he had acquired so many of the bull's metabolic aspects, today he's 40 years old and at the end of his life from organ failure and other symptoms of old age. The dangers aren't always so intense though, and are usually something more like if you fuse with a coyote, you might get a prey drive similar to a Sudosian or a Nushu's. To talk more about fusing with something intelligent, an example is Bella Desert, a Tarasian woman who fused with a Daludon. Her story is that the Daludon was her only friend when everyone else was bullying her. It was old though, and soon got sick to the point that it couldn't swim anymore. That's when she decided fusion was the only hope of reviving her friend, and it worked. She says since then she sometimes has another force in her head, 
like there's someone else in there with his own wants and desires. Though it doesn't speak any language she knows, she swears she can understand it sometimes. Bella also has a working eye in the middle of her forehead that she doesn't seem to have any control over. Most humanoid mages train to harness their powerful emotions into magic, and the best of those might be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the new shoes. However, these aren't what scare the people of the old world so much. People of a country called Anthropos found an exploit to strengthen their magic without so much training. Let's talk about Anthroposian blood magic. When someone dies, it's not like their mana just spontaneously disappears. While in most species it accumulates in and around the stomach, humans have a high concentration of mana in their blood. Still, mana is figuratively burned in the stomach and has to get there to be used. The people of Anthropos bought together by a shared belief around a certain translation of a religious text, erected a practice of magic centered on drinking the blood of others to power their own magic, though it does introduce some health concerns. As their saying goes, with a drop of blood we can take a man, and with a man we can take a city. Nowadays, Anthropos has turned this into a business. Speaking of Anthropos, let's look at the individual countries and talk about them. In my next video, or whenever I get around to finishing a video called Speculative Anthropology Humans. Check out my Patreon, which you can subscribe to for just a dollar a month to support me and get your name at the end of my videos. Thanks Captain Kobop, Art of Dying, and Mr. Kill. This video has been a long time coming, and I'm even more excited for the Anthropology one. Hope you check that one out, but either way, thanks for watching!